recording. So, hello and welcome to Hello and welcome to this session on advanced network analysis and specifically today we're going to be talking about uh, a bit about graph theory and about graph metrics in particular. So, when you're building a network uh, doing a net, conducting a network analysis. The network graph itself is kind of a visual component that helps you understand what visually and kind of in that intuitive way, what uh, the network it looks like and the connections are. Um, but the analysis part is actually all about the graph metrics themselves. And that's the really core cool component to a network analysis. They're what actually tells you about the topological structure of the network itself and the relationships between the various nodes. Um, and so this is, this is the core component of a network analysis and it's important to be able to interpret these kind of metrics appropriately so that you can understand what's actually happening within the network and be able to convey that to other people. So today's session, we are going to start with a bit of a spiel from me around graph theory um, and why graphs are useful representations of data. We're going to look at uh, types of graph. Um, then we're going to get a whole load of graph metrics to look at. Which you're incredibly excited about that. Um, and then we're going to have a little break and then get into um, implementing and interpreting graph, graph metrics in, uh, in an, uh, an exercise. So kind of objectives for today are understanding how graphs are used to represent data um, and then being able to know how to conduct an analysis of a network and finally being able to interpret common graph metrics because it's all well and good being able to conduct analysis and analysis but if we can't convey to other people what the analysis is telling us, then it becomes completely uh, useless. So let's make our analyses useful and interpret what is coming out of them. So graph theory. This is a particular branch of discrete mathematics and it has, oh, there is so much work on graph theory. Um, that if, if you just Google graph theory and start having a look around, you will be um, inundated with uh, lots of extremely complex mathematics, um, heavy use of set theory, um, and something that uh, in terms of practical, in practical terms, a lot of it, you just need to understand the basics of how uh, a graph is described mathematically which we'll cover today. Um, so it was uh, Leonard Euler um, in 1735 who kind of first proposed uh, graph theory, uh, what would become graph theory. And he was using this as a way to abstract complex information. This is all about um, mathematically, being able to mathematically represent and solve complex situations. So, and there's one very famous problem in particular that Euler uh, used as the first ex worked example of uh, graph theory. And this is the seven bridges of Königsberg. Now, the idea with the seven bridges of Königsberg, uh, the, the story behind it is that uh, these bridges represent some pleasure gardens. They were set within pleasure gardens within Königsberg that were used by uh, the wealthy and uh, the middle classes at the time to go and wander around and have a lovely time and do all that chit chat that they uh, that they do when parading about in uh, in the gardens. And what they wanted to know was whether there was a route that they could take across the bridges 
where they only passed over one uh, each bridge once. Now, this seems like a simple question. There's only seven bridges here um, across two little islands and two sides. So you think you look at it and you go, well, of course, there's got to be a way to be able to walk across these bridges, each bridge only once. And let's say it doesn't matter which side you end up on, you know, um, that's fine. But it actually becomes a much more complex problem and very similar to the traveling salesman problem. Um, so this is where Euler came in and he decided, right, hang on, I'm, I can represent this in a different way. Um, before I show you Euler's representation of the seven bridges of Königsberg, um, I'd like you to, if you've got a pen and paper handy, you know, we'll go old school with this, even though we're teaching advanced data science here, we'll, um, <laughs> we'll go old school and start with a uh, pen and paper representation of this. Just take five minutes and see if you can plot out and find, see if there is a route that you can take where you only cross the bridges, each bridge once, um, and it doesn't matter which side you end up on or which side you start from, but you have to start from one of the sides you can't start in the middle of on one of the islands. Can I build another bridge? <laughs> <laughs> I feel this would just, be a simple solution. <laughs> just, just take five minutes and have a go. Um, can you end um, up in the middle? Can you end up on an island? You can end up, you can, can end, you end up, up on an island. Yes. You can end up on an island.
Bye, Chris. Uh, I think I'm all right. <laughs> it's just Beth, a long Beth, day. You're not, you're not muted, Beth. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, but uh, I think, I think. Okay, right, let's come back, come back into the room. And has anybody been able to find a solution? No. no. <laughs> okay, this is one of these things that um, what graph theory or what Euler presented as graph theory was actually a, uh, a theorem and what became proof of um, Eulerian paths. Um, and he was able to demonstrate that basically it's all to do with the degree of the nodes here. So on the right here, we can see Euler's gra graphical representation of the seven bridges problem and on the left the literal representation what you'll notice is that Euler represented the bridges not as nodes but as edges as the lines between each of the nodes and this is where graph theory became something different it's not a um, a literal rendering of topology. It's, um, it's something more general. And in this instance, with the seven bridges problem, what he was able to demonstrate is that the, if the degree of all the nodes is odd, then there is no way to traverse each one only once it, it it doesn't work it's it's something that um that is impossible to do so what you'll notice is that each node is joined by three edges and so these are odd numbers of edges if you removed one edge from this you would be able to complete it or if you added an additional edge somewhere it would be possible. But because each node has an odd number of edges connecting to it, it, it is impossible. Now, what this starts to be able to teach us is that in terms of understanding the structure of a system or uh, some kind of network of whatever it is, people, organizations, um, we can start to understand th certain things about the structure of that network based on measurements of the graph structure. So here we have each node has what's called degree, the degree of three. That means that it's connected, um, it's, it's intersected, sorry, by three edges. And so degree is one of the first graph metrics that we're going to meet today. And that is the number of edges that intersect with a node. And one thing that we can learn from this when they're uh, all of the, uh, the degree of all the nodes is odd, then it is impossible to traverse each uh, edge only once and complete the path around 
uh, the network. Okay, so building a little bit more on what we looked at last time in the introduction to network analysis, we looked at uh, and discussed nodes and edges. And here we can see a little bit more of a complex um, representation of the simple diagram that I showed last time. And if you remember, nodes are also called vertices. That's the more mathematical term for them. And they're represented using the mathematical notation V subscript and the number of the edge. And so a list of vertices can be described as V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, up to Vn. And when we mathematically describe that, you can see on the left here, um, capital V, so our list, our set of uh, vertices is described in this way, V1, V2, up to Vn. And we can then use this description to describe our edges. And this is what we do when creating our data that goes into creating a network, is that we describe the source, the source uh, vertex or node, and the target vertex or node. And so here we, we can describe our set of edges. We can describe edge one, E subscript one, as V1 to V2. And we can describe edge two as V2 to V5. And this provides, this works in terms of set mathematics for being able to perform various calculations on, um, on, a, uh, on a network. And for simplicity, you can also describe edges as simply, you can name them E1, E2, E3, E4, E5. Now, just to go back over some of the nomenclature that we used last time. So edges that have the same end vertices or the same end node, so for example, edge one and edge two here, are considered parallel because they have the same end vertice, uh, vertex. An edge which is um, has the same vertex as its start and end point is called a loop or a self loop. And here we can see that with this example E3 here, this is a loop, a self loop. And these, these are important to consider, particularly in terms of healthcare, where people are coming back into a service time after time after time. We need to be able to include that kind of data when we're looking at our system structure and understanding how the system is operating. If you see people coming back in time and time and time and time again, that can be indicative of either that um, this is a, a repeat use service um, or it's indicative of somebody is not receiving the treatment that they need. So it's it kind of under starting to understand what operationally these uh, these representations of edges and vertices mean in terms of our healthcare operations. Um, edges that are adjacent share a common vertex. So here um, E2 and E4 share the node V5. Um, and two vertices are adjacent if they are connected by an edge. So you get, and we get lots of adjacency. And this is also where the matrix that we create that fully describes the network is called an adjacency matrix, because it's all about how the different nodes 
are connected to each other. But if you're, if you're reading around the subject of net, a network analysis and graph theory, the concepts of adjacency, parallelism, and self loops are common nomenclature that you need to be able to understand. Sean? Yes. Can you explain what's the difference between parallel and adjacent then? So it's all to do with uh, direction in this instance. What we've got here is actually not a directed graph. So the difference with parallel is that the, they have the same end vertice, um, which means that if, for example, we had V1 to V2, we, our source was V1 and our target was V2. And for E2 here, if we had V5 as the source and V2 as the um, target, both E1 and E2 would have the same target, uh, the same end node, and that would make them parallel. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. I think it's just, it's like you say, a direction wasn't obvious there because it's not specified. That's it. It's not specified in the diagram. But yeah, it's just simply that word. And it's, it's a small distinction. Um, but but yeah, uh, it relates to the di uh, directionality or lack of in a graph. OK, so because this is a very large branch of uh, discrete mathematics. Um, what they try, <laughs> what mathematicians like to do is describe everything completely, as completely as they can. And this means that we need to understand some of the very simple graphs that can be created. And I mean, they go as far as to define an empty graph which is a graph that has no edges. It has only vertices or nodes, as we can see here. A null graph, which has no vertices at all. It's just, there's it's nothing in it. Um, a trivial graph is one that has only one vertex. And most importantly here, every, uh, a complete graph, every pair of vertices is adjacent. That means that each, no, each vertex is connected to every other vertex or node. And that's, that, that's an important concept that, uh, that you need to, need to remember. So we can have graphs that are entirely empty or entirely complete. And when we build a network out of real world data, what we actually get is something somewhere in between. It's not an empty graph or a null graph, but it's also not a um, complete graph normally. Okay. So when we're looking at um, graphs and deciding how to represent our data in a graph. There are a few different ways that we can choose to do that. And it's important to be able to be selecting the correct graph for the data that we want to represent. So in discussion there with, uh, with Richard about the directionality of a graph, we get undirected graphs which are, um, uh, which have direction doesn't matter on the edges. These are the most uh, kind of, in some ways, the simplest form of graph that, that you create. With a directed graph, direction does matter. And here you can see also, these are the network X commands so we introduced uh, the package uh, network X last time. Uh, this is one of the most useful uh, network analysis 
packages in Python. And you can, uh, an undirected graph is just nx.graph. And if you want to create a directed graph, you have to uh, explicitly state that, and that is nx.digraph. Um, and you'll also see digraph used within uh, any uh, within the literature, as that's kind of its uh, more formal name. An interesting one is we also get signed graphs. Um, so this is where you can attribute either positive or negative um, increment or decre decrement to um, your edges. So this might be useful where you simply want to, instead of using actual numbers, show where there are increases or decreases of, for example, uh, patients moving between services. Um, or uh, whether there is um, an increase in planes traveling between particular airports or a reduction in that in planes traveling. So you can just, just use this very dichotomous uh, symbolic representation. A multigraph allows for um, edge attributes um, to be added, which go beyond simple signs or numbers. And this means that you can attribute categor categories to your edges and have multiple, more than two um, edges connecting between two vertices. So in this, so normally in a directed graph, you would have direction between, for example, A and B, or B and A. And those are the, you would, so you would have a maximum of two edges between any two sets of vertices. In a multigraph, you could have more because you would have, for example, as we see here, uh, categorical, um, the edges as categories. So you could have two, three, or four um, edges connecting between any two vertices or nodes. Um, yeah, multigraphs are a bit of a new and special type that um, of graph that uh, have kind of come about as um, network analysis has been used more, particularly around social network analysis, where categorical variables are uh, there's a, a much more multitudinous. Um, and importantly, we get weighted graphs. Um, and weighting is where you attribute a uh, number to the edge uh, between two nodes. So this can be thought of as the amount of activity between two nodes. It's the weight. And you can have weighted directed graphs um, and weighted undirected graphs. And you could also have uh, weighted multigraph, a uh, weighted multigraph as well, and assigned multigraph, assigned undirected graph, and assigned directed graph. So these different types of graphs do cross over. Um, the main distinctions to understand are the undirected and the directed type graphs. Okay. So I'm just going to stop there. Um, are there any questions at the moment um, about any of what we've covered? Okay. Okay. So we can see that um, networks are just built up out of uh, nodes and edges. And that's, that's great. It means that we can represent things as dots and lines and build up these complex graphs. 
but what does it what does it all mean in the end okay so we need to think about metrics and how we uh, quantify the structure of the network and the relationship between our nodes so at its most simple actually understanding the numbers of nodes and edges within a network counting them up is the best way to start understanding uh, and we'll put this in the context of um, health and social care that if your nodes are services how many services are you representing or teams are you representing or departments are you representing within your graph and then how many different ways do these services, teams, departments interact with each other, the number of edges. And then we can look at things like density. So this is the number of um, edges and the number of connections between nodes um, that actually exist within the graph. And then the number of possible connections edges between our nodes. So it's looking at the proportion of actual edges in relation to the number of possible edges that there could be. And this gives you an idea of the connected uh, the level of connectivity within the within your network. Um, then we've got things like average degree. So I mentioned degree earlier and degree is the number of edges that are intersecting with a node. And we can average this across the network to be able to get an idea of the average number of edges that are intersecting and intersecting a node. So um, this will give you an idea of on average how many interaction other services are is a service interacting with within your system um, and this starts to give you an idea of the complexity of the interactions between uh, the entities within your system your services or your departments or teams and then things like network modularity these look at uh, the connectedness again of the graph and uh, modularity in particular looks at um, maximizing where the maximum number of connections are between groups of uh, nodes and where there are less connections and starts to separate them based on groupings of highly interconnected nodes and splitting them out from uh, less connected groups or groups that are connected to each other groups that are connected to each other but then the connections between those groups are less and then at the node level so when we're actually thinking about okay what's happening in terms of our individual services departments teams um, we're looking at the number of edges that are intersecting a node. Um, so this is the degree, as we said, and this is important to understand for each uh, individual entity, each node. And you also get in a directed graph, the in degree and the out degree. And so this is the number of edges for which the node is a source and the number for which it is a target, where they, whether they're starting from, which is the out degree, um, or finishing at that node, which is the in degree. And then you get the modularity of each node. So that will give it its grouping. That's a useful measure to start with, to start looking at the connectedness, how things are grouping together. And so we got this, um, it's, it's all about understanding the connectedness because things like eigenvector centrality 
they look at the uh, the connectedness of the nodes in relation to the whole network. So whereas degree just looks at the connectedness of a node in relation to the edges that are coming into it, eigenvector centrality looks at the connectedness of a node in relation to the rest of the network and looks proportionally at how um, connected it is to other connected nodes further out. So two, three, four, five nodes distant from it and whether it's facilitating those connections. And there's some heavy mathematics that you could look at uh, in order to understand how exactly that is being calculated. But for simplicity, the description is the connectedness of the nodes of a node in relation to the rest of the network. And this is really useful for identifying those uh, nodes that are facilitating um, connections between within the network and you identifying your central facilitators. Okay. So to give an overview of uh, some of the some more metrics that we're going to discuss now in more detail. We've got things such as um, approximations and heuristics. So a lot of um, a lot of the metrics are um, actually MP hard problems to solve. And that means that when you have the, um, the number of solutions increases exponentially in relation to the uh, complexity of the network. So the more nodes and the more edges that you have, the longer these uh, it's, it is to solve these calculations. And this is particularly true for looking at how nodes cluster together, because there's loads of different ways that they can cluster together. Um, and so you have these kind of these approximations and heuristics that shortcut come up with shortcuts for calculating how um, nodes are connected and how connected they are and how connected they are in relation to other nodes. Then we get a lot around centrality. So looking at degree centrality, eigenvector centrality and cat centrality. And these are just different ways of looking at how important a node is in relation to the rest of the network and how interconnected it is. Um, so we get clicks, clustering, communities is another one. Um, community finding is a big topic. And again, this is one of those that um, looks at different um, possibilities for grouping, um, uh, grouping nodes based on uh, kind of their nearest neighbors and their connectedness with their nearest neighbors. Uh, for example, the greedy modularity communities simply um, attribute uh, a modularity factor which is constantly recalculated um, as random walks are taken through the graph as with uh, the seven bridges, when a um, when an algorithm is exploring a graph, it goes from node to node following the edges. And this is called a random walk when they walk through the graph. And what it's looking for is look, check, testing out different routes through the graph and trying to understand how connected things are to each other. Um, and as it finds things that are more connected, it recalculates its modularity values. Um, understanding isolates. Uh, this is an interesting uh, concept. So this is where you have um, nodes that are isolated from the rest of the network they have no edges connecting them to any other nodes. So um, identifying 
those services that sit on their own um, and are not interacting with anybody else is um, useful uh, in terms of operations to question, should that be happening? And then why is that happening? Should they not be um, connecting with, with other services? Or maybe they shouldn't and they are on their own and can be removed from the graph. Uh, looking at uh, link analysis, so um, whether they you can predict whether a, a link over time might appear within a network. Um, looking for shortest paths through a network, so um, this actually we'll discuss in terms of looking at how uh, uh, looking at uh, care pathways and determining what kind of pathways people commonly use and similarity measures for comparing different uh, comparing whole graphs right okay so all of the analyses uh, approaches that I'm going to show you today are all from network X the package network X this is a link to the documentation for these. The set of um, analysis metrics I'm going to show you today is only a small subset of what is available. Um, but these are those that I found most useful when looking at healthcare operations data and describing uh, those, those kind of networks. So um, do have a look at the Network X documentation. Right, um, managed to whip through this quite quickly. Um, so what I think we might just have a little break just for, just have a stretch for five minutes and then we'll come back and we'll go through these descriptions of uh, different graph metrics and then we'll look at actually conducting an analysis of some data ourselves so if you can come back at uh, 20 part uh, sorry at 25 past um, that would be great just um, keep yourselves on mute with your video off and we'll restart again at 25 past thank you Right, so let's get back to this. Right, what we're going to do is now just go through some more in-depth descriptions of um, the graph metrics in Network X and the, um, the functions for implementing them and the return values out of them and look at the application of them as well, because this is the important bit. This is how you actually interpret them in relation to your data. Um, and what I've done is tried to provide an application example in relation to uh, kind of health and social care. So hopefully for um, those working in the police sector, these also have similar um, applications as well. So as we discussed, the degree refer refers to the number of edges intersecting a, ver a vertex or a node. And you get in and out degree, which is uh, in a directed graph. So this is the in degree, which is the number of incoming edges and out degree, the number of outgoing edges from a node. And then the average, either average degree or average um, in and out degree um, can be used to provide a uh, an overview of the degree within across the whole network and uh, then you can also use other measures such as uh, the standard deviation uh, the minimum and maximum values so you can look at your range within the degree to provide even greater granularity and greater uh, uh, greater description. So if you have um, a lot of highly connected nodes or a, a very few 
um, a, a lot of uh, unconnected nodes or low connected nodes, then um, you can start to describe that. One way to describe, uh, to actually uh, nicely uh, represent degree uh, within uh, network is to plot it as a histogram. So you can see the distribution of degree across your uh, network. Um, and degree itself is one of these um, mat uh, metrics that helps you to understand the level of complexity within your system. And it's at what's called the nearest neighbor level. And this is your nearest neighbor within a graph, uh, within a network graph, is uh, those nodes that are directly connected to another node. So the closest nodes to them. Um, and so yeah, in operational modeling, we can think of this as the number of interfaces that a service has with other services. Um, and I think this is in some of the work that I've done, uh, this is really important for understanding when you might have 20 plus uh, interfaces between one service and other services, um, or even teams at the team level, you start seeing 20 plus interfaces, then there's a lot of interactions that staff are having to understand and to deal with. And that's, that's a lot to hold in your head. <laughs> um, and so understand helping teams to understand which other teams they're interacting with the most um, can help you set up better lines of communication between particular teams um, and can be used to uh, say perhaps to rationalize uh, the number of interfaces between teams and go hang on you probably shouldn't be referring to these services we'd actually put you should be going through just referring all of these um, patients to this particular service or to this particular team. Um, so it can start to help you understand what the interactions between your teams are. And so when we implement this in Network X, it's simply uh, using uh, NX, which uh, precedes all these functions is just the shortcut for network X when it's imported. That's the uh, standard convention. And it's uh, simply degree. And we pass in the whole graph and we can either define a number of, uh, a bunch of nodes that we want to subset out of the graph. Um, Quite often, it's worth just doing this for the whole graph and then looking at the, uh, working with the output data. Um, and also saying whether there are weights associated with this graph. Sean, sorry to interrupt. Um, uh, are you supposed to be screen sharing? I'm just because we're not seeing anything. Oh, sorry, you're not seeing it. So I, I didn't know oh, if you please. weren't. <laughs> Why? My apologies. <laughs> now you can see what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the function itself is just degree. You pass in the graph object here represented by G. And you can yeah define the subset in M bunch, a uh, subset of nodes as a list of uh, node labels, um, node IDs, and you can also pass in uh, the weights attribute if uh, there is uh, weights associated with the edges. Um, and what this returns is either um, if you just pass in a single node, then it will return the view of single node or M bunch of nodes but it will just return a, um, a, I believe it comes out as a pandas data frame 
or um, a NumPy matrix, um, and it returns the degree of all the nodes. So it will have the node ID and the uh, degree for that node. So modularity. So this is where we're looking a bit more at the structure of the network and how it breaks up into um, different modules, um, how it can be uh, containerized. Um, so when I've been looking at mental health data, for example, with this, um, modularity tends to split the data up by a geographic region. Um, if we're looking across the whole of Devon. And so you'll see that, for example, you know, it's a nice example that you see um, North Devon teams working more closely together with greater interactions, South Devon teams, the Exeter and East teams. And yes, there's connections between them, between these regions, but they're fewer than there are within the geographic areas. So modularity is a good way to be able to look at how these uh, different, this, this, uh, this natural organization of the system uh, occurs. Um, and so kind of in, it can help you split out things by geographic region or um, whether we, if you're looking perhaps within region, different groups of teams that are working together more closely than with others. So you might see community uh, teams working more closely, or perhaps there's a group uh, in mental health where you have escalation um, through services that the extra teams are working closely together, that the um, uh, Team Valley teams are working closely together, the Honiton based teams are working close and that you'll see it going, uh, you'll have the community teams, the crisis teams, the AMP teams, and they're all grouping together in some way. Um, and with when we visualize a graph, we can use modularity as a way to be able to um, color, for example, color the graph um, in order to demonstrate different um, groupings of nodes. Um, and so that can be a useful uh, visual representation of um, the node, uh, node groupings. And modularity is often used as a first cut when looking at groupings. So it's a useful indicator of whether clustering or community detection is, is appropriate to apply, whether you do have, there do appear to be groups um, forming within the network, which there more than likely will be. Um, when this is implemented in Network X, we use uh, modularity matrix is the function on an undirected graph and just pass in the graph object itself and your optional arguments uh, whether you want to do a subset of that using node list argument and whether there are, there are weights uh, associated with it. Um, if it's a directed graph, it's simply directed modularity matrix. It's just a slightly different um, algorithm that they're using. So it's separated as two different functions. And this returns you a matrix of, um, so it'll be uh, M, N nodes by N nodes matrix of modularity. Sean, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so uh, am I right in thinking that, so your, the modularity is essentially how well your uh, network graph kind of clusters into clusters of connectedness? Um, yes. Is, is that right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's one way to, and there are lots and lots of different uh, community detection, clustering, modularity uh, algorithms. Um, and it takes time to work out which ones work with your data. You just have to try um, 
different ways, uh, different algorithms for trying to cluster it. Uh, it's a bit of a um, trial and error situation. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Density. So, um, really useful uh, metric when, uh, again, looking at the complexity of the graph. And this is more about the completeness. How many edges are there? Um, how many actual edges are there in our real world graph, in our real world data, compared to the potential connections? And this returns a value between zero and one. Zero being that there are no edges in the graph, that it's an empty graph, if you remember back to our simple graphs earlier, uh, or whether uh, it's one, and that's a complete graph. And so, yeah, you get this um, proportion of actual edges in relation to all the possible edges uh, being present. And in terms of the type of interactions that you want to see within your system, if you want a highly connected system where every team is talking to every other team or every department's interacting with every other department, then you'd want a higher density within your system. But if actually you want more discrete pathways um, with kind of this minimal crossover, between pathways, then you'd want to see a much lower density value. And this is simply, uh, again, and this is what make net, net, makes Network X so powerful, is that it's uh, the actual functions are very simple. <laughs> so um, when you're doing density, it's just density and you pass in the graph object and that just returns your density value. Okay, cliques. Cliques are one of these, uh, again, kind of community detection strategies. And this is formed by, so it goes round the graph, removing edges until they get, it finds a complete subgraph is the idea. So if it's going around looking for cliques, it will see Okay, I'm going to remove this this edge. Is um, do I have a complete subgraph? No. Okay, I'll put that edge back in. I'll remove this edge. Do I have a complete subgraph? No. And it keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, and then it will remove two edges, and then three edges, and four edges, which is it can take a little while computationally to do, <laughs> um, depending on the complexity of your graph, but. Essentially, it's going around trying to find subgraphs within your graph um, to identify particular cliques um, together. So those that, where everybody is all connected together. Um, and so in kind of small to medium sized graphs, which would be classified as less than 200 nodes, uh, roughly. Um, this can help to identify where you've got these groups of highly linked services um, and is an alternative to clustering and com other community detection techniques. When we implement this in Network X, um, we want to use uh, the find cliques function and pass in the graph object itself but it needs to be wrapped in a list um, because what it's going to do is uh, pass out, hopefully, when it finds multiple clicks, cliques, um, that it will pass those out as a list of lists. And we can then just ask for the number of cliques that um, are present within a graph um, by simply using number of cliques and passing in the graph object. And that's just useful for um, being able to see if, uh, if it's worth looking for cliques within 
your graph. Because if it goes as just one, um, it means that there's no, it's, it's not finding other, any other uh, smaller complete subgraphs and so no cliques. So it's better to then look at using clustering modularity instead. So uh, the fine cliques returns um, all of the maximal cliques in an undirected graph. So these are all the maximum subgraphs. And yeah, uh, number of cliques returns the maximal, uh, the number of maximal cliques for each node. Okay, clustering coefficient. Okay, we've got a, this is again another way of <laughs> looking at um, clustering community detection. But this one works with large graphs. Um, it's, it's a bit faster and um, it's better when you've got uh, large graphs tend to be more sparse. And when I say sparse, it means that um, there are less connections. Um, there's more nodes, but less uh, connections between the nodes themselves. So while overall you might have more edges in your graph, um, and obviously each, each node is likely connected to another node, um, they might not be connected to 20 nodes. Um, it might only be connected to one or two, so it's more sparse. And so this is where it's looking for the number of complete triangle subgraphs. Um, and so if you remember that image that I showed at the start um, of a, a complete graph where it had three nodes and three edges between them. So each node was connected to each other node. That's a complete triangle subgraph. And it's trying to find those within the network. And because it's only looking for those specific, um, is, is searching three nodes in, a, in the nearest neighbor algorithm and looking for that uh, completeness is a much faster algorithm. And so where, where you do have a lot of nodes in your graph, it's uh, often the best way to be able to look at um, uh, cluster uh, grouping of, of uh, services and nodes. And it's also, uh, again, a useful one for being able to uh, color nodes so to see how they group together and visually explore the graph. And that's simply in, in Network X uh, implemented using the function clustering. And again, you just pass in the graph object, the whole graph, and it will look across the whole graph for, for this. Uh, you could do a subset of the graph using nodes and also pass in a weight attribute if required. And it will return a, um, a vector of the clustering coefficients for uh, all of the nodes in G. OK, centrality. Um, so centrality, this kind of this builds on this um, idea of connectivity that we saw with degree. And whereas degree is a nearest neighbor approach, it's only looking at those nodes that are closest. It, um, it's eigenvector centrality in particular looks at the um, facilitation of connections within a network and kind of looks at the degree of nodes beyond the nearest neighbors of a, any node, of a given node. And so this can be used, and it is, is really, really useful for identifying um, those nodes which are centrally facilitating the connections through your network. Um, it's, it's an incredibly robust method um, that's used all the time um, and is a useful one, again, when visualizing your results to be able to um, easily separate out nodes 
represent the nodes different sizes for example or different colors in order to be able to um, easily visually identify these centrally uh, central and uh, facilitating nodes within your system uh, yeah so those with a high eigenvector centrality are those that facilitate the provision of care within a system they might not provide it all but they facilitate it so um, again, taking the example of the mental health data, um, what we often saw was that it was the, um, the liaison teams that are the central facilitators along with the crisis and the amp teams because they're interacting so heavily with all the different services across the system and facilitating the care of um, patients who are escalating, whose um, case is getting, uh, who, who require uh, more intensive treatment. And again, simply in, uh, implemented within Network X um, using the function eigenvector centrality and you pass in the graph object G. And you can set the um, number of iterations within this because it's um, Again, this is a computationally expensive um, thing to calculate uh, because it depends on the random walk that uh, the um, that is being taken by the algorithm through the network. So um, it's getting a balance in the number of iterations that it will do to try and get a robust measure of centrality against computational time so it's just something to be aware of and play that you want to play with and run centrality the centrality algorithm several times to see what level of variation that you get and increase your number of iterations uh, uh, gradually until you reduce your variability in the re in the results um to uh, uh, a, a, an okay figure that, that you're happy with, that you're um, not uh, getting spurious results, which are too different each time. So this comes back to the idea of running trials um, that Dan introduced yesterday in uh, discrete event simulation. And yeah, so this returns uh, the eigenvector uh, of uh, all the eigenvector centrality um, for all the nodes in the graph. Okay, um, identifying isolates. Um, so this is a node that is not connected to any other nodes within the network. And yeah, these are interesting for two reasons. It's either to see that they are not interacting with the rest of the system and whether they should be removed from your analysis um, as they're not into playing any role in facilitating anything within the system or whether actually they need to be investigated to see why they're not interacting with any other um, nodes within the system. And so you can return the uh, ID of the nodes that are isolates using isolates and passing in the graph object or the number of isolates um, using the number of isolates function and passing in the graph object again. Uh, and yeah, they'll return either a, um, a vector of IDs of the nodes that are isolated or the, um, the number, just a single value, the number of uh, isolated nodes in G. Okay, link analysis. So, um, Page rank um, is one of these that was developed as a way to rank web pages. Um, and so this was used to look at the uh, structure of the incoming links, um, how many, where they're coming from. And it's, it's an alternative to eigenvector centrality. 
um, and is best used with a weighted directed graph um, because it works. Um, it, it, it takes into account uh, the weighting of the edges and their direction. And so it's looking, it's kind of determining what it's called in quality of um, the incoming links. Um, and determines the page rank of a vertex. So it's coming up with a way of just ranking each, uh, each node in relation to the others. So yeah, uh, it's, it's really useful in terms of, because it's more of a uh, literal measure of centrality, it's use, it's, um, equates its page rank equates to the probability of an edge being traversed within the network. So that means the probability of that edge being used by anybody within the system and the probability of a patient moving between one service and another. And as such, you can actually use page rank as a way to build a probabilistic network model um, to look at change in um, the change in system use over time and to, and also to predict forwards how the network might change over time uh, and so this is implemented using the function page rank uh, passing the graph object in and here you have um, some other um, additional um, arguments that can be used. So uh, looking again at the number of iterations that are going in, um, tolerance, so, and alpha values, which look at defining the, um, the amount of change that is tolerable um between iterations until it stops um so essentially looking to uh, how robust how consistent your values are um so when i mentioned with eigenvector centrality that you can run the maximum iterations that you're looking to get stable values here within page rank what you actually have is uh, you can set that tolerance uh, within the function itself and it will so you could set your maximum iterations to 100,000 but once the tolerance um, is met um, and the variability between runs between iterations is met then it will stop and break out of its cycle um, and so this just, again, returns the page rank of the nodes within the graph. Okay, shortest paths. So um, this is a, a quite common task and it's just finding out how distant one node is from another. Um, so this is the number of the minimum number of edges that an, must be traversed between one node and another. And so, yeah, this is useful for looking at how different services are separated by other services, other intermediary services, and looking at common care pathways. Um, and so looking at these kind of shortest paths, these common paths, you can start to identify patient pathways where maybe perhaps they're not formalized, more those kind of informal, naturally occurring care pathways, and look at them uh, as uh, to inform the design of more efficient care pathways where you might not, there might be an intermediary service which actually is, is, is not um, necessary, but it's just because that's the way that things have been done. Um, patients go through a uh, intermediary service, which is unnecessary. 
Um, and so two useful functions around uh, looking at shortest paths is to um, use the shortest path function, pass in the graph object. And if you define the source and target node or a list of source and target nodes, then um, it will look for the shortest paths between um, those uh, either just that subset or um, across the whole graph. Uh, that can be quite computationally expensive to run it on the whole graph. So you tend to run it with subsets um, of uh, nodes, uh, source and target nodes, looking more specifically at particular uh, teams or services, so particular nodes. Um, and you can also uh, see if there is a path between two nodes um, as, as a first kind of first thing that you do just to see if there um, is a shortest path and you can see uh, has path G and define your source and target node for that. And those source and targets, again, these are all the IDs. These are the node IDs that you'll be using. Okay. Um, similarity measures. Um, these are um, really, really interesting type of measurement that looks at the whole uh, structure of a graph and compares them. And what it's trying to do is see how many changes it needs to make to the graph to make them isomorphic the same. Um, and again, this is an MP hard problem and is incredibly computationally expensive on large graphs. So it tends to be used with small subgraphs, um, but is uh, something which is really useful for looking at system change over time. Um, so just looking at how the operations uh, within a system are changing over time um and whether during different months which teams are working more with which other teams for example um so again there's a number of different algorithms for this um the kind of the base ones within network uh, network x are graph edit distance and optimal edit paths and optimize edit paths. And you just pass in your uh, two graph objects that you're wanting to compare. Um, and so graph edit distance returns a distance value. So this tells you just as a single value how different the two graphs are. Uh, optimal edit paths returns all of the minimum cost edit paths for tr transforming G1 into G2. Um, and so that's all about yeah, the minimum number of changes that need to be made in order to transform G1 to G2. Um, and optimize edit paths returns the node edits, the edge edits, and um, the uh, cost for transforming G1 to G2. So that gives you more detail as you go down these functions here. So that is an overview of some of the core um, graph metrics that are used to describe uh, the the graph itself, the network itself, compare graphs to each other, compare nodes with each other, um, and describe uh, the uh, kind of the operation of the system. And from this, you can really start to um, express what is happening within a network and communicate that in language, which means something to 
uh, to people that isn't just um, a, a list of numbers. And this is key because you get a lot of different values coming out of uh, network analysis, which if just presented in a table saying something like a page rank value for your different nodes, it's, it's what does that mean? That, that needs to be communicated to people in, in some way. So there's, you know, being able to do that verbally and also as uh, in a visual way is incredibly useful. Um, and, and actually how that, that communication needs, needs to occur, particularly with such complex systems. It's this way of abstracting and simplifying what is a very complex system. So I think what we're going to do is take a 15 minute comfort break uh, and, and have a good stretch and get a cup of tea. And after that, we'll come back and we've got a task to do. I'm going to get you to do to conduct a network analysis on some data. And that will take us up to uh, up to lunchtime. And I'm going to be asking you to um, look at two data sets and compare two data sets and come up with some kind of interesting insight. Um, and so I recommend pulling up the uh, Network X documentation for yourselves. You'll have the link in the slide deck and or just Google Network X documentation and have a little, you know, use that as a resource. Um, and uh, the analysis task.py file will uh, give you some, some starters for 10 as well on conducting the analysis. So, yeah, I'm going to ask you all uh, at the end of the task to um, put something in Slack which uh, you found out about, uh, about the data that we're going to use and to just put, put something interesting in that you found. So do be prepared to, to do that. So um, have Spider fired up and ready to go and make sure the data is in the right place and you've got the analysis, analysis task.py file ready to go. So we're going to come back at uh, 20 past, uh, 20 past 11, um, and we'll get going then. So see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Recording. OK. So if I share my screen. OK. So the task that you're going to undertake is two. What we're going to do is look at uh, two sets of data uh, two different graphs, and these are taken from Game of Thrones. And just to show you quickly, so there's a great website called Network of Thrones, uh, a song of math and Westeros. Um, splendid. If, if, if you're into uh, the Game of Thrones books or the, uh, the series, then this is a fantastic website um, in terms of playing about with the data and uh, being able to look at the complex world that is Game of Thrones from a bit of a different perspective. Um, there's a really nice uh, introduction to network analysis in here. Um, and I must say, uh, some little bits, some little bits of the explanations I've, I've used myself um, as it's very nicely laid out and uh, talked about uh, a lot of the concepts that we've discussed today, just with uh, brief little reminders in there. Um, there is um, a whole load of data. Um, so there's network data for both the books and the series. And this is what we're going to be using today. We're going to be using the series one and series two data and comparing those two uh, networks. 
So yeah, you can um, have a little explore of that website in your own time if you're if you're interested. But what we're going to be doing is yeah, using the season one and season two data and conducting an analysis on these. And so in the uh, analysis task.py file, I have uh, created for you um, the uh, graph builder function, which takes the, uh, the Game of Thrones uh, node and edge data and transforms it into a graph object that you can then conduct an analysis on. And I've put some of the analysis functions in there for you. So if I just bring this up for you, this is the analysis uh, task.py file. It's got the imports for network X and pandas. There's then a function uh, which creates a graph object using node, uh, the node and edge data and returns a graph object. Um, there are, I've put in uh, read, uh, pandas read CSV functions for the season one data. Uh, and this is the function call here, create graph is the function call to create the graph object using the data. And then you'll see these will be familiar now. Uh, some of the um, functions that we've discussed um, for analyzing the networks. So what you'll need to do is to you see, write something to read in the uh, season two data as well and create another graph object for that. Um, and then explore the data. So I'd like you to adapt the code to perform an analysis on both the season one and season two data. Compare the various metrics for both seasons. And then I'd like to come up with just an insight, an interesting insight um, from the analysis that you've conducted. And this can be in the form of either uh, just words, in just just you know words and uh, stating the values, but giving an interpretation. I'd like you to give an interpretation of what your insight means, um, rather than it just being here's the values and here's the difference between them. I'd like you to tell me what that means in relation to the data, and whether you decide to use graphs um, within this, that's up to you. Draw on your Python experience thus far and you know use that to help you conduct the analysis and to be able to present your interesting finding. Um, what I'm going to do is we'll give you um, a good good chunk of time for this uh, to be able to have a go. So I think if we take half an hour and I think working, if you work on your own, so you conduct the analysis on your own, but try, but use the Slack, um, use the Slack uh, channels to ask questions um, within your support groups or of specific people. Um, or use the um, network analysis channel to uh, ask of everybody um, what you know if you've got any questions or you know you're having an issue use use slack for support um, but go through do the analysis on your own and um, try and come up with your own insight and then so uh, just before uh, 12 o'clock um, or yeah at, at 12 o'clock if you can post in the network analysis channel so in the modulate network analysis channel if you can post in here your um, actual uh, your your insight and then I'll pick on uh, 
few people to just say a little bit about their insight and how they got that. So um, the mentors will be uh, kind of around and monitoring the chat, but try and use each other as the support network and ask questions of each other. Um, if you do have a, uh, an issue that you don't seem to be able to solve together, then ask directly of one of us or um, probably post in, yeah, uh, just just uh, put, actually mention one of, one of the mentors in particular and uh, ask us to come in and help. So uh, off you go, have fun. Um, you've got all the data, um, you've got the analysis task, got the slides, use those as your resource, um, use the Network X documentation if you'd like, and let's see what happens in Game of Thrones Season 1 and 2 from a network perspective. Thank you. Okay. Just going to share my screen with uh, Slack on it. So let's just have a little look at what we've got here. Um, so Imka's come up with uh, some nice insights here around uh, centrality, clicks, and density and isolates. Um, so we see Starks and Baratheons central to the story in uh, season one, where that shifts uh, to those connected to Daenerys uh, in and the Targaryens and that in season two. Um, so the cliques uh, is all around uh, the Stark, so Ned and Kate, uh, Caitlin. Um, in season one and then season two is more around the Lannisters and it shifts to telling more that side of the story. Um, density slightly higher in season one than season two so there's a little bit uh, higher uh, connect interconnectivity between the characters. Um, no isolates which is um, interesting. So uh, there's there's no lone lone wolves as it were to uh, use a bit of Game of Thrones parlance if uh, if you've seen it as uh, the dire wolves. Um, yeah, hopefully we're not spoiling anything here for anybody, but there are um, I think seven seven or eight seasons uh, to go through and have a look at. Um, so uh, the clicks, uh, it, it kind of becomes less disparate in season two, Dan's saying, um, with a greater number of clicks in uh, season two, uh, sorry, number of people, the number of clicks that people belong to seems to have gone down in season two. Um, Joffrey's a big part, so we've got the um, Baratheon Lannister crossover there in season two. Um, Ned Ned's the central character in season one, um, and yes, we we know what happens to him. Well, I do now, a... yes. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be rooting for Ned if I ever watch the thing. <laughs> oh, it's so worth watching! So worth watching because you do you root for him. And <laughs> um, Daenerys, uh, yeah, major character in both seasons. Again, it would be interesting, you know, there's, you can play about with this because the data's there for all the seasons, see how this plays out across across the whole thing. It's a fantastic data set, actually. Um, and if you do watch it, it um, kind of adds all that context. Um, so, yeah, Ned, Ned definitely, um, his um, page rank score will drop in season two. Um, Tyrion, yes, big central player um, in in both seasons. Thanks, Jenna. And um, Ned, Daenerys, and John in season one main characters. Cersei, Daenerys, and Arya in season two. So they do they switch it. Um, 
interesting this one uh roughly the same number of nodes in both series um more edges in season one than season two but not a huge difference and actually this is really interesting because this shows the usefulness of actually quite simple metrics um within network analysis when making comparisons that um there was obviously a uh, something in george martin's head when he was writing this um the books are incredibly heavy and even the uh, the tv series is complex and but you're working with a limited set of characters in both um and there seems to be the upper limit that uh, is not going beyond so it would be interesting to see if that plays out across the rest of the series as well um and that kind of the levels of interaction are kept similar so there might be something about the formula that the writer's writing to in, in that um yeah and so yeah uh, if if this is what anybody's appetite for um uh watching game of thrones then uh you might want to to have a look and get into into that um so i'm gonna pause now um for for any questions and we'll just see if um kind of how you found that and if um you can see the usefulness or if you've got any questions about application and kind of how you'd use any of these in relation to perhaps your own projects so